D-181 was used to being picked as a test subject for the various dangerous and downright terrifying experiments and lab work the SCP Foundation had him perform at Secure Facility Site-32. He'd been working for the organization for nearly five years, and he considered every day he was alive a blessing, and you would too if you were a D-Class personnel. While no one's too sure on the exact methods the SCP Foundation uses to recruit its D-Class personnel, there are a few prevalent rumors, most of which you've surely heard before. Death row prisoners taken into custody by the Foundation to be unwilling lab rats, ordinary people that society wouldn't miss that were kidnapped off the streets, or sometimes just volunteers, though we're not sure who in their right mind would willingly volunteer for one of the most degrading, dangerous positions in the entire Foundation. The truth about D-Class is that every site does it differently, and the Foundation is well aware of the controversy among its personnel that comes with recruiting and using D-Class personnel. Heck, some sites don't even have D-Class, citing their use as inhumane. But at Site-32, things were ordinary, and D-181 was one of the many D-Class personnel drafted into the Foundation via the United States prison system. Day in and day out, D-181 would have to perform tests and experiments, most of which he knew next to nothing about. Thankfully for him, D-181 had two benefits that made his stay at Site-32 a little easier. First, there was the fact that Site-32 was a low-priority facility. It was located far away from any major population centers, and overall lacked the expensive funding some of the larger sites had. The anomalies contained there were still pretty dangerous, but due to the lack of available funding, most of what the Foundation was able to afford at Site-32 was regulated to safe and Euclid-class objects. Now, as we all know, object class has nothing to do with danger levels, and instead is based on the difficulty the Foundation has containing a certain object more than anything else. So when a site such as Site-32 is underfunded, due to being less of a priority to the larger organization, they're typically only going to be containing the bare minimum in terms of expenses. That means less expensive containment and less elaborate objects for D-181 to work with. It wasn't a guarantee of safety, as nothing ever is in the SCP Foundation, but it was at least beneficial to have an understanding of what's going on in the various experiments D-181 had to perform throughout the day. The second thing D-181 appreciated about Site-32 was a little less conventional. The entire facility was staffed by women, with the exception of male personnel being used for testing purposes. The reason for this is due to a very specific detail about today's anomaly, which we'll get back to, but it was something that D-181 never took for granted. Of course, D-181 was an absolute buffoon when it came to dating, and relations between testing subjects and researchers were discouraged, and in some cases forbidden. However, he never gave up hopes that he might be able to now find a girlfriend while living in a building that was less than 1% male in population. It is important that we state that D-181 was always respectful to women and never stepped out of line, which, as far as D-classes go, makes him top-tier boyfriend material. Maybe there's hope for him someday, so long as he survives the deadly daily grind of being on the lowest rung of the Foundation. While these two things kept D-181 as happy as someone could be while essentially being enslaved to the Foundation, there was a lot to be unhappy about in his position. First, there was the general danger that came with testing with anomalies every day, where anything and everything could go wrong, and your safety was never guaranteed. Then there were the dreams. Most of the time, D-181's waking state felt like a dream, so that meant the images his brain showed him at night were extra weird. The horrors and oddities that D-181 witnessed during the day always came back to haunt him at night, whether it was a stack of talking bowling balls attacking him in the grocery store, or a teacup that made his skin invert itself every time he drank it. The SCP objects D-181 worked with always cropped up in his dreams at night, and they always seemed to be worse. D-181 asked the other D-Class personnel stationed at the site if they had strange dreams too, and most of them agreed that they experienced them as well. Apparently working for the Foundation fired up the imagination in an extra special way that seeped into nighttime, when D-181 would ideally be receiving some well-deserved sleep from the strangeness of the day. 
But one dream was bothering D-181 significantly more than usual. It was a recurring one, happening again and again every few nights. The same series of events, playing out over and over again. The strangest part about it was that it didn't feel like a dream at all. D-181 would be laying in his bunk inside Site-32's D-Class barracks, desperately trying to fall asleep. Eventually, he would, but he wouldn't realize it. D-181 would feel like he was asleep, but he could still see the barracks around him, except he couldn't move at all. D-181 was experiencing a form of sleep paralysis, a phenomenon during falling asleep or waking up, where a person is unable to move or speak. Hallucinations during sleep paralysis are common, but the whole experience typically only lasts a few minutes. For D-181, it lasted a lot longer, and he was aware the entire time. So D-181 would be laying down in his bunk, trying to fall asleep, when he would suddenly become unable to move. Then, from across the room, he'd see the door to the barracks open. D-181 knew that the barracks were only accessible to the upper-ranking personnel, and they never came around. First, D-181 saw a large cylinder move itself slightly into the room. Then the figure it was attached to waddled its way through the door. A giant fabric doll, so big that it could barely fit itself into the door. If D-181 could scream, he would. He recognized the figure as an instance of SCP-2386, one of the anomalies he was working on. The doll walked slow and heavy, trying to not collapse over its own weight. It was made of pink fabric, with its face stitched together with thread forming a sly smile and two buttons for eyes. It was terrifying. What was even worse were the two pairs of wings on the doll's back, like the kinds you'd see on a butterfly or a moth. The brilliant patterns looked like they were made of cloth, sewn to a pair of ordinary insect wings and completing the doll's patchwork appearance. The insect doll combination stumbled towards D-181, moving across the barracks slowly and nearly falling over several times. The creeping terror of the doll's slow advance only made D-181 try to move more, but he couldn't. He was completely paralyzed and subject to whatever the doll was about to do to him. Eventually, the doll made it close to D-181's bunk, standing over the bed and staring at D-181 with its lifeless, button-eyed face. It just stood there, staring. D-181 was sweating, with tears in his eyes. He tried to scream again, but nothing came out. And then, to make matters worse, the barracks door opened again, and what made its way through shook D-181 to his very core. It was another doll, even bigger than the other one and behind it was another doll, and then another. Four dolls in total made their way into the room and stumbled over to D-181's bed. They continued to stare, crowding around the sleeping D-Class like he was a television set, and their favorite show was about to begin. Just when D-181 thought it couldn't get any worse, the dolls extended their stubby felted hands over his face, all four of them moving in unison, and then they stopped and D-181 heard their voices. Well, not their voices exactly, but voices nonetheless. High-pitched, barely human, childish voices started whispering to him. They weren't coming from the dolls, but they could talk. D-181 was positive this is what they'd sound like. You knew he was a great You're the Malvation's greatest asset! We love you, D-181! We love you! All of these seemingly innocuous phrases were things said to D-181 while he was surrounded by the giant dolls. On paper, they sound encouraging, but the context of the situation and the way they were said made them anything but. And this would continue for what seemed like hours, with the dolls crowding D-181 and speaking to him in his paralyzed state, shouting the most deceptively kind things possible over and over again all while D-181 was aware the entire time. But before he would wake from this awful dream, one of the instances would lift their stubby hand forward, directly hovering over D-181's arm, and the doll's appendage would caress him, squeezing and playing with his arm like it were a toy. By morning when D-181 awoke from his dream, he felt like he was never asleep in the first place, 
and that he could remember every agonizing second of the past night's experience. This would continue almost every other night. As soon as D-181 would fall asleep, the doll dream would occur again. As soon as he woke up, he feel like he got next to no sleep the night before. It was draining him and inhibiting D-181 from performing his duties accordingly. One day during testing, D-181 fell asleep in the middle of an experiment and dropped an important component to the object he was working with, which nearly set the entire facility on fire. After that, D-181 knew that something had to change. D-181 recognized the dolls. They were instances of SCP-2386, which he had worked with previously. In fact, it was the experiments with SCP-2386 that injured D-181 on his right arm, causing an infectious spot to crop up. What caused this? And what exactly is SCP-2386? We'll get to all of that soon enough, but we need to focus on the dreams. It was three weeks into the dreams, three weeks since D-181 was injured during testing, and three weeks since D-181 had a good night's sleep. He met with Dr. Shaw, the head researcher in charge of SCP-2386 experimentation and someone who worked with D-181 many times. Dr. Shaw and D-181 sat down and prepared an interview. She began, Good morning, D-181. You say you've been having recurring dreams? D-181 shuffled in his seat a bit. Yeah, hi, Doc. Ever since I got this thing, it wasn't that bad at first. D-181, of course, was talking about the red spot on his arm. Shaw asked him to explain the dreams, and D-181 did. He explained how he would be in his bunk, feeling almost awake but not quite, when giant versions of SCP-2386 would make their way into the room. They'd gather around his bed and stare at him, shouting things and caressing his infected spot. Dr. Shaw listened intently. D-181 was clearly shaken up from relaying the experience to another person. He continued, barely able to hold himself together. You see, something had changed the night before D-181 spoke to Dr. Shaw. For the first time, the dream was altered. Uh, actually, last night they did something different. Another one came in, it had something with it. it looked like a baby one. It was all wrapped up in this white cloth. They said something about wanting to show me what I was working towards. They pulled back the cloth over its head and it was a, a bug's head. Look me right the heck up. A baby with a bug's head was definitely strange imagery, but Dr. Shaw was unsure what it all could mean. She knew SCP-2386 were insect-like, and with the way D-181's infection was looking, her brain began concocting a strange but potentially true theory, one that wasn't looking good for D-181. But before we get into that, let's talk about what SCP-2386 really is. They're known among Foundation personnel at Site-32 as Pink Ladies, and they are a diminutive species that outwardly resembles patchwork dolls made of traditional fabric. Think that creepy Raggedy Ann doll your grandmother has, but ten times more degraded, a whole lot more pink and straight-up insectoid in nature. They're not as big as the ones in D-181's dream, but they're actually as scary with stitched-on faces and a pair of moth wings on their backs. In fact, the actual SCP-2386 instances range from only 7 to 9 centimeters tall. Autopsies on dead instances of SCP-2386 showed resemblances to human botflies and silkworms, two species of insects that are absolutely nasty. It is terrifying to imagine something so outwardly cuddly could look so downright ugly on the inside. But that's what SCP-2386 are, but don't try hugging them either. Their cotton fiber exoskeleton is as durable as it is gross, and they're not the kind of cuddly doll you'd want to take to bed at night. In the wild, SCP-2386 are found in hives, resembling similarly patterned seat cushions. Big mounds of cloth host to tons of these tiny terrors with the biggest hive the Foundation ever came across being the size of a large sofa. These hives are commonly found near suburban environments, and sometimes even inside occupied housing. Imagine coming home to find a brand new sofa inside your house, and then realizing that it's actually home to thousands of SCP-2386 instances. When SCP-2386 leaves their colonies, it is primarily to feed on smaller insects and seek out hosts for reproductive purposes. 
Despite their cute but gross appearances, SCP-2386 become hostile if approached by males of any species and will target them accordingly. That's why Site-32 only employs male personnel for testing purposes. As soon as they're within range of a male subject, SCP-2386 will outstretch one of its appendages and extend a pair of scissor-like claws from it before swarming the male. This is what happened to D-181, which resulted in the red, infected spot on his arm. Conversely, female subjects in the presence of SCP-2386 are treated entirely differently, with the instances caring for them, presenting them with small gifts, and attempting to play with them. During the spring and summer seasons, SCP-2386 will enter their mating season and cease their hostilities towards males. Instead, they'll treat them with the same level of kindness they do with females. But this kindness is just a front. When given the opportunity, SCP-2386 will slice a small incision into the male subject and pump them full of about 30 to 65 eggs underneath their skin. Within 24 hours, the incised area will resemble patterned cloth, and genetic tests reveal it to be composed of the same material as SCP-2386's hives. In the weeks that follow, this area will spread across the subject's body, and eventually, it will open to reveal fully grown adult instances of SCP-2386, who burst from the patchwork skin. Dr. Shaw recognized that this is what was happening to D-181, and immediately got him to Site-32's medical ward. D-181 was strapped down to the table, and tried not to freak out over what he knew was about to happen. The dreams were acting as a warning, and SCP-2386 was clearly looking forward to having D-181 bear the next generation of insect dolls. Thankfully, Dr. Shaw caught the infection before the patchwork skin was able to fully take root, meaning that the eggs underneath D-181's skin were premature. Thankfully, there was still time. Surgery was carried out immediately, and the doctors weren't surprised to discover a colony of premature SCP-2386 eggs underneath D-181's arm. They were removed from the body and thrown into storage for further research purposes. D-181, after waking up from the surgery, thanked Dr. Shaw. At least now he wouldn't have to deal with those horrible dreams, and the stinging, swollen sensation underneath his arm. Unfortunately, he was still a D-Class personnel working for the Foundation, and would have many more intense experiences after this one. But D-181's gratefulness would soon subside. Within a few hours, D-181 began to ask Dr. Shaw if he could see SCP-2386's enclosure. He spent the past few weeks absolutely terrified of the species, but for whatever reason, he felt like he had unfinished business with the anomalies. He wanted to see them again. Dr. Shaw became suspicious and understandably denied D-181 entrance from the enclosure, but this wasn't enough. D-181 became violent and tried to force himself into the containment chamber. He needed to see them. He couldn't explain why, but he felt incomplete. Eventually, D-181 was subdued and returned to his quarters, but his symptoms continued throughout the weeks. He was depressed and frequently made reference to SCP-2386 as being lost or unrightfully taken away from him. To Dr. Shaw, what was happening was clear. D-181 had been affected mentally upon receiving the SCP-2386 eggs. This was a safety mechanism induced by the anomaly in case of birthing complications, so D-181 would feel compelled to receive another batch of eggs into his body if the first batch was lost or damaged. It was disgusting, and Shaw was positive it would subside after a few more weeks. But what kept her up at night wasn't the same dreams D-181 had, or the terror of SCP-2386. It was the image of D-181 scared and out of his mind, clawing that containment chamber door, begging to be used as a host for SCP-2386's next batch of eggs. Now go check out SCP-3004 Insect God Imago and SCP-439 Bonehive for more anomalous SCP Explained videos that will bug you out.